Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Dr. Michael Lomax, President and CEO of the United Negro College Fund. Michael has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be here. So let's talk about education, the importance of education, and the work of this renowned organization. Yeah. It's, it's on everybody's mind. People know what you do, but, let, but just remind us yeah. about the impact that you've had over the years. Well, UNCF, United Negro College Fund, is a 74-year-old organization founded uh, in the year uh, 1944, right at the end of World War II. And our founder was a, an extraordinary individual named Frederick Douglass Patterson. Uh, who was the third president of Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, uh, got the job when he was 36 years old. He was a visionary. Uh, if you've ever been to Tuskegee, it's in rural Black Belt, Alabama. And his first uh, big idea was to bring aviation to rural Alabama and uh, started building uh, runways where there were cotton fields and ultimately got the... Uh, the Department of War to open a field there and to begin training African-American aviators, and the result was the Tuskegee Airmen. So that's a big enough idea for one person's life, but he had another big idea. And that was at the end of World War II, the men and women who had worked in the uh, war industries, the, the ones who had fought in Europe, uh, in, the, in the seas, uh, in, the, in the air, the ones who'd been uh, elsewhere in the campaigns, would come back and they need more education to be able to compete in the post-war economy. And he, most of the education at this time, 90% of all African-Americans who went to college were going to a historically black college. And he created a United Negro College fundraising organization, got John D. Rockefeller to join him in year one, raised $750,000, about the equivalent of $10 million today. And we've raised nearly $5 billion since then and will help nearly a million students graduate from college. So we've been busy. It's, you've been busy. It's an amazing story of innovation, and, and no time is more important to remember that story mm -hmm. today. We are in an economy that is changing ex very rapidly. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we are in a post-industrial world, although we have industrial production. Mm -hmm. We need people to re-educate themselves and be positioned to re-educate themselves in a way that embraces lifelong learning because this economy is shifting so quickly. Yes, it's, you know, it's, this is the economy which ba is based on mental aptitude and uh, complex tasks. Knowledge, the ability yeah. to acquire new knowledge yeah. throughout your life. So you, so, uh, and, and it's gonna require the individual not to rely just on being trained, but on self-learning and self-development. Yes. And that you'll, everybody will have in the, or should have in the 21st century, an individual uh, education plan, which is a lifelong plan. People are living longer, they're working longer, and you know, if, if they can continue to retool, mm -hmm. uh, they can continue to earn for a very long time, and uh, most, most people, I count myself in that group, uh, we're not interested in retiring, they're not interested in going out to graze, we wanna continue to be productive citizens and have an active intellectual life and also an active economic life. So one of the things that, that is, is so important about the United Negro College Fund is that the, there is this disparity mm -hmm. in the asset base that um, African Americans have in comparison to people like me mm -hmm. of European descent. When you look at how that translates, when the asset base is so much leaner that, as, that base cannot be leveraged for other purposes. You cannot use your narrower asset base to create a cash flow through loans. Mm -hmm. You cannot use those resources in ways that people who have assets take for granted. Look, so many people in the African-American community, although a large number of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Yes. And you know, I, was, I saw something in the paper recently you know, uh, the significantly large percentage of Americans who do not have the resources to meet a $1,000 unexpected uh, bill. Right. And, you know, I mean, that's, uh, we're, we're the richest nation in the world, you know, this huge economy. 
uh, we have some of the wealthiest people in on the planet living here, but that has not trickled down to others. And you know, I, I'm not an economist. My job is I'm not a labor economist, but um, I believe deeply that what we do, which is to provide educational opportunity, is an incredibly important element of closing the wealth gap, closing the employment gap. And uh, so, you know, every day at the United Negro College Fund, we are helping thousands of students with scholarships. And we are also uh, doing a lot to support uh, private historically black colleges and historically black colleges writ large. There are 102 of them. They educate 300,000 students. They produce 50,000 graduates a year. The lifetime earnings of the graduating class from all HBCUs this year will be $143 billion over the course of their lifetime. It was at 60% more than it, th those individuals would earn without a college education. So, you know, I view our work as educational, but I also view it as economic. I view it as social justice. I view it as the work that is helping to uh, help this be a more perfect union and live up to its, its, its value. And societal transformation. Yeah. In terms of, of how the organization functions, there's this image that somehow there are a bunch of people that write checks, you act as an intermediary, and then you write checks in return. Mm -hmm. That's not how it actually works. Well, the good news is there are still a lot of people who are writing checks. And we have about between about 150,000 donors annually. You know, it's a very large uh, base of... And what is your annual funding? Uh, uh, small donors. Uh, our, well, uh, our annual this year, will our, our total budget's about $200 million. We're awarding about $100 million in scholarships. We have an annual campaign. We're in the last two months of it. We'll raise somewhere north of seventy million dollars this year. So we're replenishing that, and we get some very large gifts, which enable us to to give uh, you know a large number of scholarships all the time. But but the, here's the point: that for we we award ten thousand scholarships. For every scholarship we award, there are nine highly qualified other applicants that whose needs we can't meet. So um, there are more young people who want to go to college. There are more middle-aged people who want to return to get a degree. And many of them look to UNCF and there is unmet need. And so we need more of those checks. I would say something about money. Money is critically important. We meet the financial needs of, of, of low-income first-generation students by and large. But we do more than just give money. Right. Our scholarships provide wraparound services that, that help uh, a generation of students who have no one in their family who've ever been on this journey before or gotten as far as they are. And so we're helping them uh, stick to it and you know, overcome the emotional and social obstacles as well as the financial ones. Well, very often there are ex executive function skills that, that come with this. There are the emotional skills yeah. as, as when you become the only person in your family or the first person in your family, mm -hmm. you carry with you an incredible burden. Well, you, you carry with you an incredible burden and a lot of responsibility, but the impact that you can have is, is extraordinary is as well. Amazing. So, you know. Uh, and there's we, pride. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, the, the reality is that when you get your first college graduate in a family, you don't have your last. And, and typically right. uh, that college graduate is gonna be helping not just uh, educate him, herself, siblings, nieces, nephews, grandchildren. Um, you know, this is, this is a journey for a family led by one. The nature of education is changing very rapidly today, particularly higher education, mm -hmm. where you do most of your, your work. Talk about how that change is affecting how you look at education and what you, uh, uh, what you are considering funding in the future. We're having increasingly uh, for-profit colleges mm -hmm. and universities. But regardless, you also have online courses, yeah. you have distance learning. There are so many rich tools, but tools that, that are sometimes not applied well are applied yeah. in abusive ways that do not actually yeah. increase skills. Um, how are you thinking about the entire sector? Well, I, I, I think that uh, you know, we spent this 70s, 80s, and 90s focused on 
how are we going to transform K through 12 education? I'm not sure that we did. I'm not sure that we we have done all the work that we need to do. But uh, higher education sort of sat complacently and said, you know, we're the best in the world, and uh, you know, until we started to look around and we saw the graduation <laughs> rates in some other places. Well, right? not only that, but uh, we saw the disruption come to higher education. Right. And the disruption, the big disruptor in education today is technology. Uh, it's individualized instructions. It's the use of uh, all of the mechanisms that we like to play with every day. But it's going to change the, the nature of it. I mean, and, and my view is uh, those people who stuck their head in the sand when the printing press was, was produced, <laughs> the first big technological change which made books available broadly to all people, um, we have to look upon the computer and technology as democratizing education, but not necessarily lowering the standards. You know, people said, oh, people won't read, they won't write when they have these, all these gadgets. Uh, you have greater access to information at your fingertips. Um, you know, I, you, you certainly can find it more, more quickly, but you still have to read it, you still have to digest it, you still have to be able to, to deploy it. So I, I lean into the technology, and I think we're going to have to figure out how to embrace it. Um, what I believe we have is our greatest resource is human beings. It's a, it's a renewable, they are a renewable resource. Uh, what we want to do in education is to give them all of the tools to, to live richer and more informed lives and to be active citizens. And if that means that they learn they get part of their education through an online course or a series of online courses uh, that they take at midnight uh, because it's you know because they've been working all day long. Then that's terrific. So you're not only in the business of transforming the lives of individuals; you're also uh, part of this movement to transform the the way in which education is provided. You know, we're giving people the tools to be self-determining, and we're also in, uh, challenging them to be leaders. So in that sense, we're saying, here you have the tools, and you also have an obligation and an opportunity, go forth and make a difference. A fascinating story about the new United Negro College Fund and how that new organization is informed by your very long history of service to the public and to the nation. We're trying to get people to realize that um, we're an organization that continues to have impact and, and they can help us have more. Dr. Michael Lomax, thank you so much for sharing the story of this amazing organization and thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for giving me this opportunity. For your insights. Thank you. Thank you.